Kilda team, my name's Ben, and let's talk coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. So coronary, these are relating to the heart. These are the arteries, the blood vessels that feed the heart muscle itself. So not the blood flowing through the heart, but rather the heart muscle, the myocardium. Coronary artery disease is broken into two bits. So this is chronic, so a chronic ischemic heart disease, and then our acute coronary syndrome. So let's start on this side first. So ischemic heart disease is when myocardial ischemia occurs. So decrease in blood flow to our heart muscle. So this, most commonly, it's going to be because of atherosclerosis, where we get this, this plaque that makes the lumen or the inside of the coronary arteries too small. But it can also be for other reasons. For example, vasospastic or presmental angina. So with this one here, we have a decrease in supply of blood to the heart muscle because of vasospasm. So we get a dysregulation of vasoactive substances. So this person will have a vasospasm or constriction of the coronary arteries leading to pain. With coronary artery disease, it's all about when the coronary arteries can't supply enough blood flow and oxygen to meet the demand of the heart. With stable angina, this is where the person does something to increase the demand for blood flow to the heart. For example, I mow the lawns, I go for a walk, the heart rate increases, so it now demands more blood through the coronary arteries. Unfortunately, if we've got this big atherosclerotic plaque, it means we can't increase the supply through the coronary arteries to the myocardium. So therefore, we're gonna end up with anaerobic metabolism, and lactic acid and hydrogen production and therefore pain. So this is our stable angina. So when this person rests, stops exercising, the demand is going to decrease until it meets the amount of supply the coronary artery can give and now the pain will subside. Or they may take vasodilators like GTN which increase the vessel diameter enough to increase supply to take the pain away. So stable angina will have the stable plaque and they'll be able to predict their pain pattern. Uh, the other part of ischemic heart disease is silent myocardial ischemia. This one has the similar symptoms but without the pain. So this could be a diabetic patient who isn't controlling their blood glucose and that leads to damage to their blood vessels and our nerves need blood flow. So if the blood vessels going to those nerves are damaged, then those nerves can be damaged as well. So this person will get myocardial ischemia, decrease blood flow to the heart, but they won't get the typical heart pain sensation because of the nerve damage. So this is quite dangerous because if I don't get that pain, I don't get the warning sign to call an ambulance or to see the doctor. All right, ischemic heart disease, this is chronic. And then when something changes, then we go to this side, acute coronary syndrome. So with this one, we have our atherosclerosis of our coronary artery. Our stable angina was on this side, and we've got a nice stable plaque. When we get to acute coronary syndrome, that stable plaque has now become an unstable plaque. And this fibrous cap that normally sits on top of the necrotic core of our atherosclerotic plaque has been ruptured for some reason. And that necrotic core is now exposed to the blood and we get a clot forming. So this is unstable angina. The person may have had angina for years, but then that fibrous cap ruptures and our clot forms, and now the normal stable pattern of I go for a walk, it gets sore, I rest, it goes away, or I take my GTN and it goes away, now that's not true. 
So unstable angina won't be relieved with rest and the vasodilating medicine like GTN won't be as effective. So something changed. Also the pain levels will be greater. Uh, with unstable angina, we're not causing infarction yet. So there's no, there's no tissue damage, but just ischemia. Then if this thrombus, if this clot gets bigger, that moves us into an NSTEMI. So non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So infarction is death. So this time, the clot's got so big that we've got such a small amount of space in the artery for blood to go through that the ischemia turns to hypoxia and the hypoxia is so bad we get infarction or death. If the clot gets even bigger, we get a STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction. So this ST and non-ST elevated, this is to do with the ECG. So the wavelength and the patterns on the ECG. A non-STEMI won't show the ST portion being elevated, whereas our STEMI will show the ST portion of that wave being elevated. The other differences between them, with our non-STEMI, because we're still getting some blood coming through, we tend to get a subendocardial infarct, which means only part of the wall of the heart is going to be infarct and die. Whereas with a STEMI, because there's a full inclusion, full occlusion, then we're going to get a transmural infarct, which means the infarction or the death goes right the way through the wall of the heart. The other thing we want to look at is troponin. So when cardiac tissue dies or infarcts, the body releases troponin into the bloodstream. It's one of the proteins um, in the heart muscle. So with stable angina, which is part of ischemic heart disease, there's no cell death, so there's no troponin released in the blood. With unstable angina, it causes ischemia, but not infarction, so no tissue death. So there'll be no troponins in the blood. But then we move to in STEMI and STEMI, now the I stands for infarction. So there's going to be tissue death. So if we do a blood test, we're going to see troponins in the blood. So even though the non-STEMI has less occlusion than the STEMI, which is full occlusion, we have a similar mortality rate because potentially with the non-STEMI, it's, it's less of a an immediate concern, so the treatment might be delayed. And if someone gets seen with a STEMI, they get rushed and treatment is prioritized. All right, team, coronary artery disease, done.